Uh, thank you all for, for being here. I'd like to first begin by congratulating everyone on Tuesday who shut down Ray Kelly. And I think that, I think that it needs, I think that we all recognize that the shutting down part was important because if it would have just been a protest, it wouldn't have garnered as much news, as much publicity, as much momentum. We wouldn't have received a letter from the president. We wouldn't have gotten the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and all of this stuff. So again, big congratulations. I know it's a lot of work and it's really hard. And a lot of the times we're not, we're not thankful enough to those who organize it. And it's um, something that we need to counter, um, especially when we hear the vilification of those who organized it. What I want to talk about today um, is the divisions that exist in uh, between a couple of divisions, but an important one between the university and that outside of the university. Um, most importantly, the, the community that is right next door that is so invisible so many times, um, where racial profiling has existed and has not ceased for, to exist, um, and where a lot of work has been done to try to counter it. Um, but what I want to talk about um, in, in continuing my congratulation of the students and of the community, but in particular the students in this part, because uh, I come from a global studies, international studies kind of background, and the way that we're trained is that we're going to go to other parts of the world and fix what's wrong over there, and that often distracts from things that are wrong over here. So in thinking about in thinking about un undoing these divisions, I think that an important one is, is maybe to take up the framework that there exists not just a third world out there, but a third world in here, and this is supposed to be the first world. No, and it's only a couple of miles away. So um, something that I, I want to talk about is how these divisions, how these invisibilities are produced. And I think that one important way is by the way that we're taught to define certain things. So like the term criminal, um, when we think of criminal, we don't think of Wall Street bankers, right? We think of black and brown people, we think of poor people. Uh, when we think of, of drug users, this is actually um, something I think about quite a bit because I grew up in a poor black and brown and poor white community and, and it wasn't until college that I found out that middle class white people do drugs. <laughs> no, I and that they do it so casually and openly talk about it and they're not afraid that they're going to get caught because they're not most likely going to get caught, right? Um, so I, I, I'd like to always think about how it was that I even came to that thought. Well, one is because I didn't know middle class white people and two, though, is because the television was always telling me that, the news was always telling me that, films were always telling me that and I believed them. Um, so how did, that, how did that take place? And so another thing, too, is how then that is produced in, in the world that we live in, in the spaces that we inhabit. So how is it that Brown University, for example, is considered a safe space, and outside of Brown University is an unsafe space, or outside of College Hill is an unsafe space? It's gotten... It, and it's not even just Brown University, it's so many universities all over, the, all over the country where this is so, where they require the labor of poor people and need to have them close by, but they don't want anything to do with them, and so then they build like a, a, a world right next to them that is so, it, it's so enclosed and it's such a bubble that they don't have to interact. They don't have to see each other. Um, so how does this happen? And how does it happen then that like when we think about rape, we don't think of rape on campus, we think about rape in those unsafe spaces, right? It's, it's really created this, this idea, this fear among students, among not just students, but faculty, people involved in this bubble of the university to even go outside, outside of the university because they're afraid of who they're gonna see. And I got that when I first moved here. I, was, uh, I came to Providence last year and I was looking for my hot sauce because I need it for my eggs. And I was in... <laughs> <laughs> and I went to CVS, you know, because at home I can find it at, at the drugstores and they <laughs> didn't have it. And, um, and I asked the, the cashier, where can I get my hot sauce? And she's, she's looking at me like, oh, you're gonna have to go to Broad Street for that. 
And I was like, what, what point me to it? She's like, are you sure? I'm like, well, yes, of course. And so I went, and it was, and it, and it was obviously it's only a, a mile away. It looks so different from here. But for me, it was really nice personally because it also reminded me of home. Um, and maybe this is why, one, one reason why I'm not afraid to go there, but I don't think that you have to be from a poor community to not be afraid. There's ways that you can, you can, you can remove that, that relationship of fright. And this is something that we really should talk about in order to undo these divisions. Um, something that then um, I think is important as a university community and as a community outside the university is how is it that we're gonna connect? And not so much so in solidarity, but actually connecting together because as we heard from last night, and this is not uncommon, um, a black student, a black student is gonna get racially profiled and it doesn't even matter, it doesn't matter what you do. If you look a certain way, you're still gonna get racially profiled. There's a lot of, there's a lot of fear on campuses. There's a lot of trauma that takes place. Um, even just walking, just getting on the bus to come to campus, if, even if you are a student. So how is it that the logic of what's out there has come into what's in here? Um, one thing that I always like to think about then is how can those of us who are in the university connect with the community that's been doing so many actions for such a long time um, and need people and need resources. We have so many resources here, students in particular, that like you were tasked and faculty were tasked with reading, with writing. Like how can we hack the things that we have to do to get credit for, right? To make them useful for people outside who are actually doing work with very, very little resources. And not only that, but how can we recognize that we can do a lot of learning, and in fact, I personally have gotten most of my learning done outside of the university. You do, you do so much learning, just uh, actually having a problem in your face that you need to take care of. So it's not even theory anymore. It's an actual problem. And you can harness all of the stuff that you've studied, right? in order to tackle it, but it's always going to be contextual, it's always going to be different. So the, the, the learning process is itself, to, it, it, it's, in, it's a symbiotic relationship. It takes recognition though, if we're going to be learning outside the university, and, and I will tell you that, um, like, that, like I mentioned, I got my most important uh, political upbringing out on the streets, um, and I'm sure, I'll, Everyone that was involved in the organization of Monday and Tuesday learned so much, so much probably than they probably learned in their entire time at Brown, in just those two days, or in, in the, in the run-up to those two days. Um, but what it does take is a recognition that those without PhDs, those without masters, those without bachelors, those without GEDs are equally intelligent. They have just, people have different kinds of intelligences, different kinds of skills, and then how are then are we gonna organize all of that in order to create something? So um, I'll leave it at that. Um, what I do wanna do, just I'll leave off on a note that there are some community members here that they have a lot that we can learn from and they can uh, start talking about with us, uh, uh, brainstorming about ways of how it is that we can start working together and I and and I encourage them and welcome them to be the first on the mic if we can give them that space when we get over to Q&A and if they're comfortable with that. Thank you. <laughs>